look, if you're building an off-grid cabin, whether it's like we did for weekend use, for vacations, holidays, an escape location, or to live in full time, you're gonna face all the same kind of challenges that I faced building our cabin, I think. And I'm gonna give you a quick list of some of those things that pose challenges to us, and then I'll dive into each one of those separately and what I did to overcome them. So the first, honestly, was the foundation. Building a proper foundation for your cabin, home, whatever it is, is actually really important. And I definitely faced some challenges and have still not completely overcome all of them. So we'll talk about that. You know, vehicle troubles, believe it or not, is something that you might not think of as a challenge, but we ran into some of those too. <laughs> Weather, weather, who would have thought the weather, who would have thought that it could rain or snow or get really cold? You know, when you first start building your cabin, if you don't start building it in the spring, but you actually end up starting in the fall, like we did, at 3,200 feet in elevation in northern Washington up near the Canadian border. Weather is going to become an issue, but you know what? Weather becomes an issue forever after that. So we'll talk about that. Failing to square a wall because you're in a hurry and you frame up the wall and slap on your sheathing at least enough to hold things together when you stand it up and then you stand the wall up and you secure the wall and you get a tarp on it and you leave. And then you realize you failed to square it up. So we'll talk about that. Trying to tarp a 14 by 24 unfinished cabin in a blizzard in December. Putting a composting toilet outside because they tell you you can do that. It's just not gonna compost in the winter time but putting that outside and then plumbing to it and the problems that occur with that. And I'll also talk about freezing lines, both gray water and fresh water, blowing up water heaters. Well, not blowing it up, but might as well have been. That sounds more exciting though. <laughs> and a number of other issues. So let's start with the foundation. So <laughs> when I got the plans for my cabin, they, they come with advice on foundations, but they don't tell you what you can or cannot do. And in some states, you can't do, for example, a post and pair foundation. Some you can. Just depends on where you're building, what the codes are in that state or in your specific county and whether or not you actually have to permit to begin with. And every county is a little different. So I'm gonna talk about my case. In my case, I chose a post and pier foundation because it was simple, it was fast, it would be easy to do. I'd done enough framing and, and carpentry in the past that I understood the concept, so no big deal, right? We'll dig a couple trenches. Instead of digging down below the frost line, ah, it'll all be covered up under the cabin, which by the way was true. We'll set our havers, and then once they were set and everything was leveled, we set pier blocks on top of that, put four by four saddles in the pier blocks. These were the bolt type and then put our four by fours in the saddles and mounted a four by eight beam that we built on top of that. Sounds simple. Well, it was simple. The problem with that, which did cause some concern, is that when you build that way with a foundation that is on stilts essentially, right? It has a tendency to move. And the more weight you put on it, well, the more dangerous that becomes. And so it has to be braced and it has to be braced well. And I will tell you that as I braced that foundation, I just never got it really truly solid. And I was never really happy with that either. You could literally feel the cabin move. This post and pier foundation had a tendency to rack a little bit side to side. And even just a millimeter of racking is, well, both disconcerting and frankly, can eventually become catastrophic. And so after much bracing to try to stop that movement down and thinking, well, the more I build the cabin, the stiffer it's gonna get, right? <laughs> Not really. Eventually I realized that that foundation is just too inferior to a properly done foundation with footings and stem walls and all that kind of stuff. And when I built the back room, I tied that foundation into the main cabin and when I began the deck on the front, I did the same thing. Now, I will tell you that cut down on any movement that we really noticed, but I think there's still 
maybe just a slight sense of movement. That resulted in me realizing I would have to completely redo the foundation under the cabin. So set back in the sense that it took a lot longer to try to get that stable. And had I just decided from the beginning to pour footings and build concrete stem walls up to build the cabin on, it would have been a better build. Um, today, I'm still waiting to finish that. It's solid enough that we're happy with it. We don't have any issue and it's been like that for 15 years, but it definitely cost me time. Now, meanwhile, while we're building, we ran into a lot of different car troubles. Now I had a 1998 Jeep Cherokee and I'd done a bunch of work to that Jeep. Really got that Jeep built pretty well, but it did have quite a few miles on it. I think by the time I started building, I'd had that Jeep for about six years and it probably had another 60,000 miles on it from when we bought it, which would have put it at around 170,000 miles. Now we're driving back and forth sometimes every weekend and I began to run into troubles with it. It started having overheating issues. I was cracking headers. I had, I had to rebuild the head, all kinds of things. And you know, all of that doesn't sound like that would be a setback maybe to some when it comes to cabin building in the woods. However, if that Jeep is the way you're getting to and from your cabin, which is four and a half hours away or 240 miles, it could be a big setback. And once the Jeep actually left us stranded on the side of the road about a mile from the nearest residence, which was a farm, fortunately there was someone home and they let us use their phone to call and get help. But we had a cooler full of food and we had all kinds of supplies and gear and, and all the stuff that we would normally take to the cabin and we're just sitting on the side of the road dead in the water. Had a crankcase sensor go. At the same time, the valves were going on it, the valve seats were going, so we ended up having to do a complete head job, replace the crankcase sensor, all kinds of stuff. That set us back both money for the budget, because now you're talking a couple thousand dollars in expense at that time, and time as well. So <laughs> vehicle troubles can often cause setbacks. <laughs> weather, weather often caused setbacks for us. <laughs> Who'd have thought it was going to rain or snow or be 10 below zero? And I will tell you that when we, <laughs> by the time Thanksgiving of 2009 rolled around, we finally were up to framing the roof. And we got about 75, 80% of the roof rafters in before that weekend was up. And we had a smaller tarp, so we put that smaller tarp over it and we left. And the plan was to come back in, in a week or two and continue working on that framing. And we, we managed to get back up. It was early December and we ran into some extreme cold. It was getting down to below single digits at night and it started to snow and get windy. And at the time we had this plan that we would staple on all of the felt on the outside of the building to protect all the OSB. <laughs> so we're trying to put this felt on the outside, you know, 15 pound felt uh, to wrap the, the cabin with it. And it was tearing badly because it was so cold it wouldn't work. So finally I said, okay, that's it. We're done. We're not going to do that. But I bought this big tarp, which was like a, I think a 40 foot by 60 foot tarp. It was this massive tarp because I decided that since there was no way I was going to be able to complete the cabin and dry it in before the snow flew. I mean, the snow was already flying by this time. Best thing to do would be to get as many rafters up as I could, put this big tarp over it and protect the whole cabin. Just wrap the whole cabin up. Well, when your cabin is, <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, three and a half feet off the ground on one end, it's on a slight slope. So it's 20 inches off the ground on the top and maybe, you know, 40 on the bottom. And the walls are 10 feet tall, which is a whole nother thing. And then you've got a, a peak that's seven feet above that. You're talking it over 20 feet off the ground at the peak and you don't have a high lift or anything else to get you up there. You're literally going to have to do it on ladders, of which we had one tall ladder and a couple shorter ones, you know, maybe a couple eight footers and one 28 footer, and try to pull up a 40 by 60 tarp to get over the whole thing in a blizzard with the wind blowing everything around at 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the afternoon. <laughs> Needless to say, we did no more rafter framing. In fact, we didn't do any other work at the cabin other than to try and just get that tarp on. And then we had to pack up and leave because, well, there was nothing we could do other than camp in a blizzard. That was a bit of a setback and I did not get back to working on the cabin for two months after that.
So <laughs> weather can absolutely play a major role. And I will tell you that weather plays a role to this day. So in the dead of winter, there's no, no real cabin work going on unless I can bring up something to work on the interior of the cabin. Because now we've got power, we've got, you know, we got lights, we got heat, we got everything we need. And we could stay in, we can live in the cabin. I, in fact, lived in it for over a year. But you still aren't going to do a whole lot. It's not like you're going to be outside running a table saw in the snow. So you're, you're limited to what you can do. You're also limited in your access. Sometimes you just can't get in. There have been times when I simply could not get to the cabin. In fact, one of the times that weather played a major role was two months after the last case where I mentioned putting the tarp over the roof and everything. We headed out in February. It was early February. It was my first time going up there in the wintertime. I was driving with a friend of mine in his pickup. He had one of those Dodge Dakota type trucks. And my kids were, the boys were running the Jeep up. So they were coming behind us maybe about an hour or something like that. And <laughs> we got all the way up to my driveway and we were doing okay. No chains, he didn't have chains and we never thought about needing chains. And we got to our driveway and he made the turn to head to our driveway, started going up the hill, got around the big rock. As he got around the big rock, we headed straight up to head towards the top and we got within perhaps, um, you know, 50 feet of the, of the top of the driveway and immediately reverse direction at about 30 miles an hour. <laughs> Let me tell you, at the time I was going, what are you doing? <laughs> and Mike said, nothing. <laughs> I'm like, why'd you put it reversed? He said, well, I didn't put it reversed. I didn't do anything. So we're arguing with each other. <laughs> the, the truck stops, fortunately for us, but the driver's side tire, front tire, was right on the edge of going over the hill. We were that close, literally that close, from going over the bank and rolling his truck and probably getting hurt and losing a whole bunch of supplies. We got lucky. We backed down, the boys showed up. I said, yeah, we're gonna walk in. So we had to walk in up that icy driveway, which by the way, that's tough to do. Then walk the rest of the way into the cabin, so another uh, quarter mile or so, and we had some ATVs there. So we took those ATVs and drove those back and hauled everything in with the ATVs. And we were able to do it with the ATVs. They were able to make it up that icy hill. You know, if you're just careful enough and you gunned it just right, you could make it up. And of course, the plan that weekend was to put the door in. Well, we couldn't get the door to the cabin, much less put it in. So weather can be an issue. And then I will tell you this, after we got packed out to leave and we took off, I decided, okay, I will drive my Jeep and the boys can ride between the two vehicles. And we started heading down the road and we slid, I don't even know how far anymore. It could have been a hundred yards. All I know is that we, we fell, I was trying to drive outside of the ruts, trying to be above the ruts because they were, the, the ground was solid, frozen snow. And when there was deep ruts that were solid ice on the bottom of the rut, but up on top, it wasn't bad. So I was up on top, but I was going around a bit of a corner and the Jeep slid down into those ruts and then went down a straight stretch and around a couple corners before I finally even had any ability to try to control it. And all I could do was keep my foot off of it and gear it down. That was it. It was going down like a slot car. That was a bit of a challenge <laughs> and it slowed us down. Now, <laughs> putting the composting toilet outside. We bought the Sunmar, 2000 I think or something like that. It's an AC-DC model. You've got a big four inch stack with a, with a little 90 millimeter 12 volt computer fan in it to help the vent stack and then you have a 120 volt side with a small two inch stack or one and a half inch with also a heater. So if you're running 120 volts then you could hook that up and run a heater and thaw it out or keep it working or whatever. But what they tell you is that you could put this outside and I had nowhere to put it at the time, but they say you can leave it outside and it'll be fine. It's just in the winter, it would be like a holding tank. Well, first of all, that is true and you can do that and that's what we did. We built a little kind of a doghouse box for it, set it in there, got the slope of our sewage pipe and everything right. And despite insulating everything, we discovered that if you're not careful, your black water drains will freeze up. <laughs> if you've never had to deal with a frozen black water drain where 
you're warming up the cabin and the drain is frozen because it got frozen when you were there last and you didn't know that it was plugged up and frozen because everything appeared to flush. You just couldn't tell that it hadn't flushed all the way. And you come back to your cabin and you warm your cabin up. You get owed to no longer frozen but rotten black water drain in your cabin. <laughs> and let me tell you what, it's enough, it's enough to chase you out of the cabin. It might be 20 below zero, but you'll open the windows up and get the air moving in a hurry. <laughs> So we had to, we had to wrap uh, heat tape around it and run a generator to try and thaw out the pipe so that we could actually use the bathroom in the winter time. And that was a major issue. Now, since then, that composting bin for the toilet is in my back room, which is partially subgrade. That room is about two feet below grade with R10 foam insulation on the outside of the foundation walls underneath the slab and then R30 walls and an R32 roof. So it's very well insulated with an 8,000 BTU vented through the wall heater that helps keep it warm. All of that works great, but if you don't blow out your water lines well enough, guess what else I found out? That when it's 20 or 30 below zero and you've got a, a, a vent stack from your instant on hot water heater that goes out of that nice warm room, well, that cold air can come right down that vent stack and freeze any water that's still left inside that water heater and essentially blow up your water heater. Not like boom, blow it up, but split it all over. So when you decide to go out and turn the water back on <laughs> so that you can have a shower, well, you're gonna get a shower all right. It's just not gonna be in the shower. It's gonna be in the back room where the hot water heater is and you'll be turning it off really quickly and discovering that you can't repair it either. That's exciting, folks. I do have a new hot water heater, a, a much better one. I think it's a Bosch. No, it's a, it's another brand, but it's a top quality brand. I haven't installed it yet though, due to various issues. It's, it's a project that needs to get done. I just don't think it's gonna get done this year. I'd planned on doing it. However, we're almost into winter and we're not gonna use a hot water heater in the winter anyway. <laughs> another setback I'll tell you about was when I was living out there. So I moved out to the cabin. I took a job that allowed me to live there for a, a year and work on the cabin when I wasn't at work. It was really great. I would come home from work, change into my sawmill clothes or when it's early enough in the year that it was still daylight out. And I would go run my sawmill for an hour. Then I would come in, change, have dinner, maybe have a shower and then have dinner. And I could sit back, pour a bourbon, relax in front of the wood stove, read a book, get online, whatever. And it, and it was great. I loved it. However, <laughs> That December, I went home for two weeks. Now I left, I have a backup propane heater inside the cabin and I left that to keep the cabin at about 50 to 55 degrees inside while I was gone. That way nothing would freeze, right? The back room had its heater going and it wasn't gonna freeze, so I wasn't worried about that. But what I hadn't thought about was that all of my gray water drains go underneath the cabin, which is not skirted. I haven't gotten around to getting the skirting done. So <laughs> I, you could probably see where this is going, right? It got down to 22 de degrees below zero. When I got back to the cabin, all my water lines were frozen. My P-traps were frozen. My gray water drains were all frozen. And my black water was frozen. And I was able to run the generator and get the black water thawed out with heat tape. So that worked out. And as far as the P-traps went, I replaced some of them, but not until the spring. And the one underneath the sink, the main sink, I just pulled it out and I set a five gallon bucket underneath there to catch the water. But now I have no way of using any of my drains, even if I could replace all the P-traps because the big four inch pipe, gray water drain pipe that goes to my gray water drain system, which I got from the natural home, by the way, and I might have to do something on that because it's a great system. I really love it, it works excellent. But in any case, that was frozen and there was no way of thawing it out. It was one solid gray water sickle about 20 feet long. You're not thawing it out. I didn't have it protected well enough for the winter and it never occurred to me that with the cabin only at 50 degrees, that minus 20 plus outside is gonna be enough to freeze the, the, the water lines in the walls, and it did. So fortunately, I had a frost-free 
outside, frost-free spigot. So I was able to get water, but for the rest of that winter, I had no running water inside the cabin. I did get the water thawed out in the cabin and was able to shut off the main and clear all the lines out. So that was fine. I did save all of them, but the gray waters were all frozen solid. There's nothing I could do. I had no drains. So I had to use that five gallon bucket. Now that meant I had no shower either. No running water, no shower. Well, the shower part was easy enough to deal with. I just got a gym membership and I wanted to work out anyway. So when I was in town, I could take a break from work, go to the gym, work out, have a shower, go back to work. So solved that problem for the winter. As far as the drains went, well, I could dump the five gallon bucket over the side of the hill, which is not the most ideal thing to do, but we survived. And <laughs> wait until spring. Till I could, till things thawed out well enough that I could dig up that four inch line and replace it, which I ended up doing. And the other thing I could do was heat up water on the wood stove. And so for the rest of that winter, all I could do was go out to the frost free, get a two gallon uh, pot full of water put on the wood stove and a seven gallon water jug inside the cabin filled up with water. And that was my source of water. And hope that I didn't ever leave again long enough for things to sit cool enough for everything to freeze again. And luckily I'd blown out all the lines at that point after I got them thawed out, the main lines, and I didn't have an issue. But it did take, I think, until March or April before I got my gray water drains working again. Now my black water, I got that working because I had tape, heat, <clears throat> because I had heat tape on it and I was able to run my generator, power the heat tape, thaw all that out. But I will tell you this, that heat tape also killed my batteries two times prior to that, doing the same thing and forgetting it on when I left the cabin. <laughs> Thinking it'd be a good idea to just leave the inverter on because I had plenty of solar back before I really understood what I was doing. Big mistake. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't, want, you to, <laughs> I don't want you to think that building an off-grid cabin in the woods is just one big nightmare, but I do think it's important to recognize that there are challenges that everybody's going to face. They are gonna be different than mine or some of them might be the same as mine, but you're going to face challenges. I will tell you this though, for us, I think the turning point was the first night we actually got to stay inside the cabin. There was no interior work done yet. It was just framed, sheeted, roofed, felted windows and doors. That was it, but we were able to actually stay inside the cabin it was summer, it was, the weather was getting kind of miserable, kind of rainy, and we were in a tent trailer, and we just, it just felt like it was time. So we set up a couple cots inside the cabin, set up beds in there, and had our first night actually inside our off-grid cabin in the woods. And I'll tell you what, it was an amazing moment. It was this thing that was just, I, I think I was giddy with excitement over the whole idea. It had finally come to that. After all the months of hard work, after all the setbacks, after all the challenges that we faced, now this is, this is back in 2010, mind you, not during some of the challenges I described, but that was a big turning point. So despite all those challenges that even came afterwards, the fact that we got to stay inside the cabin for the first time was enough to kind of energize us to be able to overcome whatever obstacles came our way after that. So I think one of the key takeaways here is you're going to have setbacks, you're going to have challenges, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna make bad decisions, but as long as you stick to it, as long as you're determined, in fact, I'm gonna give you one more, and this one, uh, this is the coupe de grace. <laughs> I don't even know if I said that right, but I don't care. We were, when I had, I mentioned earlier, I built a wall without squaring it. We were in a hurry. The weather was going bad on us. We had framed up the wall. And before I squared the wall, I went ahead and sheeted the bottom half of it. And we stood it up and secured the wall and split. Well, when we got back, I don't even know, two weeks or a month later or whatever it was, um, <laughs> I realized what I had done. And I kept looking at the wall. I think I'd built a second wall and I, I stood that one up and, and I tried to make it work and it just wasn't gonna work. And, and I, I finally decided I can't pull this gap in. The, the top of that wall was twisted over to the right and the other wall on the left of it was straight up and down and plumb. So you had this gap kind of going out like this at the top. And there's nothing I could do to fix it. So I finally decided 
I've got to tear the wall apart. So I literally pulled all the wall sheeting off, ripped it off, OSB, several sheets of OSB. And if you know the price of OSB, whether it was then or now, it's expensive stuff. And I destroyed it. One whole 24 foot walls worth of OSB ripped off. Then I had to take the wall down. And the reason that I messed it up was when I put that one together, I was putting in an inset ledger. So you're, you're cutting all your studs to fit an inch and a half ledger board that you're nailing into the studs. And that's what I mounted my loft onto. And when I had put that wall together, when I framed the wall, I was in such a hurry, I dropped that inset ledger down and went, wow, it fits, and then went whack, 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 and nailed it down. And then we stood the wall up and left. Realizing what I had done, I then had to pull every single nail back out, toss that ledger board away, replace that with a new one, square the wall up first, put that inset ledger in, nail it down, put some more OSB on, stand the whole thing up and nail it all together, except I had one other problem. I built that wall in two pieces. And the second piece, the one to the left, was done right. But when I tried to make it work, if you will, I kind of had to pull things back and forth a little bit. I pulled that wall out of square and it shifted towards the half wall that was out of square when I did that. So now I didn't want to take that wall down because it had other walls connected to it. And so I decided that the way I could fix it, since I'd pulled the OSB off, was I could take the winch of my Jeep and attach it to the top corner of that wall and then pull that wall plumb again and then nail it to the already standing wall, put the one that I messed up back in place and nail everything up and I'd be good to go. It worked pretty well, except we didn't notice something. We didn't think about something. It just didn't occur to us. <laughs> so if you think my cabin's perfectly built, this proves to you that it's not. <laughs> what we hadn't thought of is we had that, we had a rope tied around the top corner of that wall and attached to the winch on the Jeep, right? That we were pulling it straight. And so you've got, you got this wall that you're, you're pulling plumb like this and it's attached to a wall right here. Well, at the very, very top where that rope was, that wall was kind of separated a little bit and we'd nailed everything down before we pulled the rope off. Could never get it perfectly nailed down on that far corner. And so that whole wall is plumb until it gets right to the very end where it kind of kicks out a little bit up there. Well, that posed a problem when I went and did all the rafters because I had to custom cut rafters for that end to try to work on it. And then that kicked out the roof a little bit on that end as well. Now I was able to make it work in the end, <laughs> but that's just something that can happen to you. Fortunately for me, I had an expression. It's a cabin. It's not the Taj, Ma it's not the Taj Mahal. It's a cabin. It's okay. It'll be fine. And it is. It's, it's not perfect, but I think it's perfectly imperfect. So again, I think if there's any takeaways here, it's be persistent, stick with it, accept that you're going to make mistakes, accept that there's going to be challenges along the way, but don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. Stick with it. It's absolutely worth it because the first time you spend the night inside that cabin, finished or unfinished, you're going to fall in love with it and the whole process makes it worth it. But go into it eyes wide open. Now, if you've got similar experiences, I'd like to hear them. Drop them in the comments down below. Let me know about your challenges. If you were building a cabin, what mistakes you made, what foibles you had. I'm always curious to hear. And folks, let me tell you, if you can't laugh at yourself, and what the hell's the point? And trust me, I laugh at myself all the time. Y'all have a great day. The old jar head out.